My name is Ann Kester. I'm with the Office of Compliance and Ethics, and I'm an adjunct instructor in the Theology Department. It is my privilege to be here this afternoon to moderate our next panel on global dimensions of religious liberty and the common good. So I'm especially delighted to introduce this impressive panel of my Georgetown colleagues. I will introduce each of them as they come forward to speak. Uh, we will begin this afternoon um, with Jesuit Father David Hollenbach. <coughs> Father Hollenbach is the Pedro Rupe Distinguished Research Professor in Georgetown's School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center. Before coming to Georgetown, he was the director of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Boston College where he held the University Chair in Human Rights and International Justice. His teaching and research deal with human rights, theories of justice, religious and ethical responses to humanitarian crises, and religion in political life, approached in a way shaped by Catholic social thought, contemporary theology, moral philosophy, and social science approaches. His books include Driven from Home, Protecting the Rights of Forced Migrants, The Global Face of Public Faith, Politics, Human Rights, and Christian Ethics, and The Common Good in Christian Ethics. Father Hollenbach has taught frequently at Hekuma University College in Nairobi, Kenya, he is currently president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. So, Father David Hollenbach. Thank you so much, Ann. Thank you very much, Ann, and thank you all for uh, being here as part of this dialogue. I look forward to our interchange in the uh, discussion that follows our presentations. Begin by just saying that it's surely appropriate that we're marking the 50th anniversary of the death of John Courtney Murray here at Georgetown. Murray's collected papers are here at Georgetown, and while he was in the midst of helping to draft the Second Vatican Council's Declaration on Religious Freedom, he contributed to a conference that I think uh, President DeJoya mentioned a while ago, the marking the 175th anniversary of Georgetown's founding. And in the resulting, in the book that resulted from that conference, Murray observed that freedom will recede from our grasp if hatreds rend the body politic and if civil friendship and even love are lacking among the citizens. It seems to me that those words are particularly applicable today in our deeply riven country and in our conflicted world. Also, I think it's appropriate that this panel is going to be addressing the global dimensions of religious liberty in commemorating Father Mary's death. Today, religious freedom is clearly an important dimension of international interaction and of foreign policy. Murray was himself fully aware of the links between religious freedom and international relations. His engagement in the interfaith, or what Bishop McElroy noted as he called intercredal efforts uh, during the period following the Second World War in seeking reconstruction, and also in his response to developing an approach to U.S.-Soviet relations, those dialogues that uh, we heard about earlier this morning convinced Murray that efforts for peace and justice required full Catholic commitment to religious freedom because he knew that without that freedom, Catholic positions on other matters of justice and international peace would not be taken seriously. Thus, John Courtney Murray knew that religious freedom is a public, indeed a political matter. He rejected the idea that religious freedom means keeping faith private. 
confined to the sacristy. Now, to be sure, Murray believed and the council taught that individual persons ought not to be forced to act against the deepest convictions of their own conscience. But the council and Murray also affirmed that all should be free to act in accordance with their convictions in public, to quote the council. For the council, the free exercise of religion includes the right of religious communities to seek to influence public life by, quote, demonstrating the second, the special value of their teaching for the organization of society, end quote. This includes seeking to influence international affairs in accordance with a religious vision of global justice and peace. Now a problem can emerge here, however. Such a public role for religion can lead to conflict with those who hold different understandings of the requirements of justice and peace, sometimes holding them for religious reasons. Brian Grimm and Roger Fink, for example, have shown that in 86% of the world's countries, people have experienced being abused or displaced because of their religion. Religious conflict, conflict is a real uh, event in our world today. Fortunately, public activity by religious communities also has very positive results, as is clear from the examples of religious leaders such as Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, recent popes including Pope John Paul II and contemporary Pope Francis, as well as many bishops' conferences have made very important contributions in a positive way toward greater justice and peace. Now, both John Courtney Murray and the council understood religion's public role in a way that had quite dramatic effects on the Catholic Church's positive commitment to human dignity and human rights. The late Samuel Huntington, who was a professor of international politics at Harvard, concluded that due to the Second Vatican Council's affirmation of religious freedom, the church was able to become a major force for the advancement of human rights and democracy in the world today. Indeed, he, Huntington noted that in recent decades, the movement of many countries toward uh, democracy was heavily influenced by their Catholic traditions and cultures. And Monica Duffy Toft and Dan Philpott and uh, Shaw uh, have reinforced Huntington's conclusion by noting that between 1972 and 2009, the Catholic community played a role in promoting democracy in 36 of the 78 countries that had substantial democratic advances. This move of Catholicism from alignment as it was the case in the 19th and early 20th century, alignment with authoritarian governments to support for governments supporting human rights and democratic governments was a very major contribution of the Second Vatican Council to which John Courtney Murray made such an important uh, contribution. Indeed, one could argue that that shift within the Catholic place in civil society could be regarded as indeed revolutionary and Murray helped the council make that move, a move that had clearly global significance. At the council, John Courtney Murray insisted on the political, juridical, and public dimensions of religious freedom, therefore. Now, early drafts of the council's declaration on religious freedom based the right to religious freedom on the personal duty to follow one's own conscience. Now, in Murray's view, that approach, grounding religious freedom in one's personal fidelity to conscience was certainly true. But this personalist argument, he argued, was an insufficient basis for uh, exploring the scope and limits 
of the free exercise of religion in public life, especially if religious free exercise could lead to consequences that had morally objectionable dimensions to them. For example, a case that I like to cite, does freedom of conscience mean that in post-apartheid South Africa, Afrikaner Christians had a right to continue to follow their conscientious conviction that God wills racial separation, that God wills apartheid, which was indeed the belief of some Dutch reform Christians in South Africa. And does this mean that those Christians in South Africa therefore had the right as South Africa moved away from apartheid to create their own white homeland from which blacks could be excluded. Some of them wished to do this. It seems to me that addressing an issue like that calls for more than an appeal to freedom of conscience. It calls for a discussion of what the limits of the freedom of conscience might be. Now, Murray helped the council address this challenge through a political argument about the limited power of the state. The spirit of the human person, Murray and Vatican II argues, transcends politics. The spirit of each person reaches beyond the political all the way out to the transcendent domain in which God exists. This sets definite limits to the exercise of state power. Protection of both the transcendence of the person and of the freedom of the church has as a further consequence that society, civil society, should be free from absolute control by the government. A misguided effort to bring the totality of social life under state control is the very definition of totalitarianism and it should be opposed both in the name of religious freedom and of human rights more generally. Religious freedom is thus linked with the full range of civil and political rights that are guaranteed by the limited state of a constitutional democracy. The Catholic community's engagement in the struggles for human rights and democracy noted by Huntington and uh, Toft and uh, Philpott and, and Shaw, since, uh, since the council, therefore, is a direct follow-up from the council's of affirmation of the foundation of the right to religious freedom. The approach of Mary and the council also has important implications for the relationship between civil law and moral law. Because the state is limited, its reach does not extend to the promotion of the full reality, the full moral reality of the common good. Work for the fullness of virtue and the totality of the common good is the vocation of the church, of families, and of the many other bodies that form civil society, including the church. The state's role is limited to the more basic requirements of social life that Murray and the council called public order. Now public order surely includes moral dimensions, moral values such as public peace, justice, and the standards of public morality on which consensus exists in society. But it does not include the total moral life in all of its virtuous forms. Only when public order is un understood in this way uh, may civil law, we see civil law taking steps to legitimately limit human freedom, including religious freedom, in the protection of public order understood as the basic requirements of public peace and justice. Thus, the Afrikaners that I mentioned a moment ago may be legally prevented from continuing their racially separatist policies despite the claim that these policies are rooted in their faith. Religious freedoms, in other words, like all freedoms, are very fundamental values, but they are not absolute. They are not without limits. They may be limited, 
but only insofar as it is necessary to secure the fundamental requirements of peace and justice. In the words that Murray himself so certainly wrote and that the council itself included in its Declaration on Religious Freedom, one can say this, the usages of society are to be the usages of freedom in their full range. These require that the freedom of the human person be respected in so far as possible and curtailed only in so far as is necessary. The Council and Mary, therefore, were very much aware of the link of the right to religious freedom to the re full range of other freedoms. It was no accident, therefore, that the Council's teaching on religious freedom stimulated new church engagement in the broader array of promotion of human rights, justice, and peace in many parts of the world leading to the advancement of democracy on the part by the church's role uh, pointed out by Huntington uh, and so forth. The affirmation of the right to religious freedom, therefore, by the council opened the door to a deep engagement by the Catholic Church in issues of global justice and global peace. Following the council, the church came to play an important role in resisting military dictatorships in Latin America through the 1970s and 1980s. It played a very important role because of the commitment to human rights that the council itself stimulated in the people power movement in the Philippines that overthrew Ferdinand Marcos in the mid 1980s. It played an also very important role in the revolution led by the Solidarity Movement and supported by Pope John Paul II in Poland in the late 1980s, a revolution that indeed can be seen as a contributing factor in the collapse of the Soviet Union. All of this, I'm suggesting, can be traced to the initiative that the Declaration on Religious Freedom played in supporting the church's growing affirmation for human rights in a broader way that reaches beyond simply religious freedom to all of the other human rights. And it has continued to play such a role in stimulating support by the church through Pope Francis's initiative in the encyclical Laudato Si on supporting uh, the Paris Climate Change Accords and a number of other continuing initiatives today. So if we are to continue on this path today, it will be essential, I believe, that we continue to understand religious freedom as John Courtney Murray and the Second Vatican Council did. This means standing up against the denial of the right of Catholics to practice their faith wherever that denial occurs, including in China, in certain Middle Eastern countries where the rights of Christians are increasingly in, under threat. It also means defending the right of Catholics to seek to shape public life in accordance with the church's vision of justice and peace. At the same time, this approach to the right to religious freedom as linked with other human rights uh, calls for affirmation of the conciliar way of seeing religious freedom as linked to the rights and the protection of the rights not only of Christians and Catholics, but the rights of others as well. The church, including its leadership, must respect the rights of others to sometimes follow a vision of social life different from the one that the church itself advocates. Now this, as has been noted earlier this afternoon, has recently led to some tensions in the United States, for example, in debates about public norms regarding health care and sexuality, gender identity, gay marriage, and so forth. In dealing with these tensions, it seems to me, we, that we should remember that both John Courtney Murray and Second Vatican Council insisted that the freedom of other communities must be, quote, respected as far as possible and curtailed only when and insofar as necessary. Restriction of the freedom of others is to be sought only 
when the requirements of public peace, justice, and moral norms on which consensus exists are at stake. Otherwise, there should be full regard and full respect for what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has called the dignity of difference. This also means giving strong support to the religious freedom of non-Christians wherever it is threatened, as for example, among the Muslim Rohingya people in Myanmar today, people who are under grave threat uh, in a Buddhist country because of their Islamic identity. It also means that though religious freedom can be seen as the first freedom, it is closely linked with all the other human rights, such as the rights to political freedom and the fulfillment of basic needs, such as the need for food and the need for health care. So religious freedom should not be seen as somehow an adversary of the right to health care. Such an inclusive commitment to the full range of human rights for all people, Christian and non-Christian, is the continuing challenge, it seems to me, for uh, the Declaration of Religious Freedom and the thought of John Courtney Murray in our pluralistic con context today, both our context inside the United States and even more so internationally. Thank you. Our next presenter is Professor Paul Heck, who is a professor of Islamic studies in Georgetown University's Department of Theology and the founding director of the study of religions across civilizations. His scholarly interests focus on the history of skepticism in Islam, mysticism and the role of spirituality in Muslim society, views on the martyrdom in the three monotheist traditions, the phenomenon of theohumanism, the emergent field of comparative scripture, and issues in political theology. Professor Heck previously taught a class supported through the Berkeley Center's Doyle Seminars Project. He is the author of Skepticism in Classical Islam, Moments of Confusion, and Common Ground, Islam, Christianity, and Religious Pluralism. Professor Heck received his PhD from the University of Chicago. So please welcome Professor Paul Heck. Thank you, Anne. Greetings to everyone. And thank you, Anne, for the introduction. And thank you especially to the organizers, John and Sam, and no doubt others. It's a great uh, occasion. I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to come this morning. I was teaching. And so I hope my remarks do uh, weave together with, no doubt, all sorts of uh, ideas that have been circulating today and will continue to circulate. So we live in a rather odd moment in history. I think we need to get that out on the table. It's an odd moment because religion is seen as a problem. It's even seen as the enemy, as the cause of hatred and violence. Many people view religion that day. And so it needs to be carefully monitored, policed, and kept under control. That's the view of religion advanced in many places uh, to make sense of governmental control of pious citizens seen as suspect, a source of volatility in society that will break out in holy anger if not heavily supervised. It's funny to think that this is the view of religion in many places today when not so long ago during the Cold War, religion was seen as the moral foundation of society in our righteous battle against communism. The grim situation today on religious liberty cannot be understood without noting this seismic shift in the global view of religion in many places, not in all places, but in many places, many circles, the seismic shift in the view of religion from friend to enemy. 
So this new societal sensibility about religion has nurtured, I'd suggest, a subtle ignorance in this country, for example, about the constitutional accommodation of religious expression in the public space. There's now hyper-anxiety in many places and many public institutions about any expression of faith as if it is the deviant rather than the norm in human life. So I'll now turn to my view of religious liberty. It's not my area of specialty, but I'll give it a go. My view of religious liberty on the global stage, but I do think it's important to keep that all in mind, uh, this seismic shift from Cold War moment to post-Cold War moment. There's very different views about religion today in the sense that I just suggested. So, I do want to frame what I'm about to say in, in broad terms. It's too simplistic and really naive to ask whether uh, Islam is the problem. And that's the question in many minds today, and there might be a discussion to be had there, but I'm going to suggest that the reality is much more complex. From fervent believer in the God of Israel to fervent atheist, all kinds of people are restricted in the pursuit and expression of their beliefs today on the global stage. Uh, there is the serious issue of state persecution, uh, which could be of a particular confession, uh, or it could also be of atheist belief. Uh, the bottom line, I would suggest, is many governments don't want their people to think. And once you begin thinking about religion in more dynamic ways, you're going to be thinking about why you have an authoritarian government. So uh, there is that serious issue, but there's also the issue of how communities, so apart from the state issue, there's also the issue of how communities view one another, and I'll focus on that here. So religious liberty is a nice idea, but there's a lot to human reality, a lot more than ideas. So when it comes to religious liberty, we also have to speak about the societal and governmental issues that enhance, promote, or impinge upon exercise of religious liberty or its, its failure uh, on the global stage. And one of those issues is the emotion of disgust, loathing. Groups, communal groups, racial groups, religious groups, all sorts of groups, they approach one another from the gut. Right? They don't approach one another from constitutional and legal ideas. They approach, communities approach one another from, from the emotions, the emotions um, in their community, in their nation, right? National emotions, communal emotions. And so it would be easy uh, if it was just a matter of acknowledging the idea of religious liberty. That would be easy. But communities view one another as threats to their existence. For communities at stake is not a moral question, liberty, but a particular identity. As a result, communities around the world exist in a fragile coexistence, viewing one another as sources of disgust. In some places, the Shia are seen as sources of disgust and thereby targeted. In other places, it's Sunnis. In other places, it's Jews and Jehovah Witnesses. In still other places, it's Christians and atheists. Christianity is apparently, I believe, the most persecuted faith today. Uh, but it's, it's not a, quite a moral question, I would say, why Christians, not moral in the philosophical sense, why Christians aren't equal citizens with civil rights in many places. That question is there, but I would suggest that the deeper question is why the cross is seen as a source of disgust in so many places, such that it wants to be torn down or stripped from a nun's uh, clothing. Why is the very existence of Christians seen as a threat to others such that their, such that their existence, the existence of these Christians, is, is, is a source of, a dis, of disgust to them? Why are Baha'is in Iran, Shia in Pakistan, Muslims in Myanmar, Christians in Egypt, Jews in many places in Europe, Jehovah Witnesses in Russia, why are these communities, these minority communities, seen as sources of disgust to elements in the majority community? Uh, there are examples of this in America and right here at Georgetown. Recently, a student group on campus uh, that advocates for a traditional view of marriage had its existence threatened, not because of its behavior, but because of its views, which were said to be hateful, the traditional view of marriage as hateful and thus to be silenced. 
That group uh, escaped the attempt to eradicate its existence from the face of this campus, but it shows we have difficult conundrums around liber religious liberty in our own backyard. So religious liberty may or may not exist in tension with a regime's interests, a state's interests. It may have constitutional support, but there's still the disgust people have, individuals and communities, this disgust they have at the existence of those whose way of life they fundamentally oppose. Do we view with disgust those who uphold marriage as the union of a man and a woman? Do we view with disgust those who oppose those who advocate that marriage is the union of a man and a woman? One can't ignore the legal, constitutional side in the discussion of religious liberty, but we also have to think of emotional anxieties in the way groups view the existence of other groups whose beliefs fundamentally oppose theirs. It might be helpful to think, I mean, you know, we in America are in this kind of postmodern age, and this doesn't always make sense, although I think it's very much apparent here, too. But it might be helpful to grasp this. It might be helpful to think about the situation of the Jews in medieval Christendom. They might have been tolerated, sometimes not, but in general, the Jewish existence in medieval Christian Christendom, um, their very existence was seen to be opposed to the beliefs of the Christian majority, a threat to the beliefs of the Christian majority, the very existence of the Jews. And for this reason, the Jew in that context was, was, was cast as a source of disgust. And that's how many religious minorities are viewed around the world today. So the, the issue at stake when it comes to religious liberty on the global stage is the perception of mutually opposed identities. Your existence isn't simply different from mine. Your existence is a threat to my existence. Your liberty is a threat to my liberty. Your identity cancels out my liberty. Your identity cancels out my identity. So communities exist in fragile coexistence, if not outright conflict, because of this perception of one another as sources of disgust rather than sources of wonder. We can talk about the idea of religious liberty in terms of the freedom of all, the freedom of all not simply to worship according to conscience, but the freedom of all, as David suggested, to be morally committed to the common good, even, even when in fundamental disagreement about core issues. But we also have to get beyond the idea and get to the gut, to the reality of disgust as the lens through which many a group beholds other faith communities. A lot of emotional work needs to be done before the right of religious communities to exist with full civic liberties, including religious liberty, can be fully established. We all need to pose the question, individuals, communities, nations across the world, do we view the other as a source of disgust or source of wonder? Do we view the Christian as a source of disgust or source of wonder? Do we view the Jehovah Witness as a source of disgust source or source of wonder? Do we view the Jew as a source of disgust or source of wonder? These questions get answered in different ways according to the country and culture and situation. Do we view the Muslim? Do we view the black person as a source of disgust or source of, do we view the white person as a source of disgust or source, do we view the Me Mexican immigrant as a source of disgust or source of, do we view the gay person as a source of disgust or source of, do we view the straight person as a source of disgust or source of wonder? Do we view the poor and homeless? as a source of disgust or a source of wonder. To see the other as a source of wonder rather than a source of disgust likely strains the moral capacity of most communities at this current moment. We have to accept the fact that humans in their fallen state incline to live in the gated community rather than the beloved community. We don't want to live with those people, those deplorables, only people like us. But at at the very least, at the very least, we can demand of all, and to do so very loudly, a moral commitment. We can demand of all a moral commitment not to have to celebrate all ways of life, but to protect the liberty, to protect, not necessarily to celebrate, we can't ask that of all people, but we can ask them to protect, to be morally committed to the protection of the liberty all enjoy, to disagree fundamentally. Even that minimal request, however, requires confronting our feelings of disgust beyond the simple idea of freedom. How can, one committee, how can one community be committed to another whose beliefs and way of life are viewed as a source of, dusk, of disgust, as something hateful, as something that ought to be silenced? So we can't ask communities to celebrate beliefs and ways of life they oppose, but can't we ask them to be committed to their protection? Reality is really a tough thing in this world. It's very tough for one people to see the dignity of another whose existence they loathe. 
Now to turn to John Courtney Murray, and again, I'm not an expert here, although I'm very inspired by his ideas, his thinking, although he might not have put it in terms that I do here in terms of disgust and wonder, I do feel his vision of religious liberty speaks to these concepts. In the United States at that time, in the time of John Courtney Murray, many people in the US felt disgust for the idea of Catholic America and for the idea of Jewish America as many today feel disgust for the idea of Muslim America, to say nothing of black America. And John Courtney Murray was also sensitive to the feelings of disgust within the church towards other faiths. But he didn't argue simply for the protection of each of the parts of the American mosaic and you know, other nations as well, a similar thing. He argued for the protection of the whole. Right? This is important, I think, in my view, that he didn't argue for the protection of each of the parts to move into their gated community, but he argued for the protection of the whole. And so he was saying to our beloved nation, no part could claim its liberties if not granting them to all. And similarly, he was saying to the church, she could not claim her liberty if not granting it to all, including those hostile to the church. In that sense, his vision of religious liberty uh, can't be reduced to a call to secularization. I think that's often the way it's seen today in the eyes of many people. Um, all that contributes to the flourishing of society is to be recognized, whatever religious affiliation it is. Uh, and that's a question here. It's a question uh, at play in all nations. Our parochial schools, and this would have perhaps been more applicable in John Courtney, Courtney Murray's day, but also in our, our parochial schools a threat to the nation, or are they at the service of the common good and therefore to be supported? Is the strong ethical character cultivated by our Muslim brothers and sisters a threat to the nation or a tangible contribution to the web of our national common good? Is the oligarchy that parks its wealth in offshore accounts depriving nations of trillions in tax revenue a contribution to the common good of the, or, or a threat to it? What are the limits to liberty? John Courtney Murray very much had promotion of the beloved community in mind, not gated communities, when he made the common good the end and purpose of religious liberty. And around, in other places around the world, how can, one minority, how can minority communities, their institutions and way of life, be seen in relation to the common good rather than as a threat to the existence and liberties of those whose beliefs they're opposed. I think that's really important to see all of these communities not as, wow, they're against me and their beliefs or, or, or ways of life, but we're all oriented to the common good. That's the work that needs to be done uh, in addition to pressuring regimes to let up on their persecution of religious minorities for uh, their own governmental agenda. Do I have a few minutes left? Yeah. So just to use, I'd like to use the remainder of my time to share what I think is a relevant experience of mine. Nearly 10 years ago, uh, when I first taught in Morocco, I found myself lecturing to a class of very pious Muslims who had real suspicion, real suspicion about the very idea of religious liberty. Namely, I believe, because in their minds, uh, this idea, they assumed it was based in a neoliberal, what could be called a neoliberal conception of freedom. And for that reason, they saw freedom of conscience as a demented idea because of the damage it would do to the moral fabric of their nation. They said to me, so I was teaching a semester long class on the concept of freedom in Islam and Christian, uh, in Muslim and Christian traditions. They said to me, today uh, you want us to accept your American religious liberty. Tomorrow you'll want us to accept abortion on demand. Today, you want us to accept religious liberty. Tomorrow, you'll want us to accept a new version of marriage which will harm our poor communities who have nothing if they don't have the family in the traditional sense. Today, you want us to accept religious liberty. Tomorrow, you'll want us to accept transnational companies that claim to be lawful by entering into transactional contractual relations with local power 
holders, but that have no moral commitment to our communities and the welfare of our communities. You are asking us to accept religious liberty, but you're really asking us to give up the things that hold our communities together. You may be asking us to accept your American religious liberty and demand that we be civilized like you, but you're really asking us to get on board with moral purposelessness. These students were not naive. They knew that faith by coercion is no faith. They appreciated the inner workings of conscience. They too were affected by anxieties we all have about our way of life that can lead to feelings of disgust towards other ways of life. They may even have felt, some of them, that Islam should be supreme over the world. But their primary concern, and I think this gets really forgotten when we hear these uh, problems with religious liberty in Muslim society, as if it's all about Islamic supremacism, some of that can be there. But, but I think this is the deeper concern and the much broader sentiment. Their primary concern, these students of mine, when it comes to religious liberty, is loss of moral purpose. And that would mean the abandonment of conscience. Religious liberty, get this as the first step towards the abandonment of conscience in their view. However, as we read Dignitatis Humanae in depth and explored a vision of religious liberty and conscience as advanced by John Courtney Murray and rooted in a profound vision of the common good and clear insistence on a moral commitment to it, as we did these things, as they saw that religious liberty and that it doesn't mean secularization. A process, secularization in Muslim societies that's often associated with authoritarian rule, the secular dictator. As they saw all this, they saw a vision of religious liberty that they could claim as Muslims for Islam. And they also saw a vision of liberty that since it was advanced by a Christian, made Christianity less a source of disgust for them, more a source of wonder. So it is, I suggest, John Courtney Murray's vision of religious liberty that will help us get beyond emotions of disgust and the fears for ourselves that are, that are at the root of those emotions and get to a sense for a common good that can be a source of wonder for all of us, helping us all see in others unlike us, helping us all see in others unlike us, partners in God's work of making all creation new. But other views of freedom are regnant in the world. And I fear what might be called a neoliberal view of freedom is only going to create more gated communities, fermenting feelings of disgust on the global stage. And that's only going to quicken attacks on religious voices, religious minorities, and also religious voices uh, that resist the pressure to be silent when it comes to the regnant paradigm of sexual and economic freedom as merely a transactional affair. And if such issues are simply transactions, it'll be power not freedom, that determines the transaction and its outcome. Discussions of religious liberty can't be separated from moral purpose. That was John Courtney Murray's gift to the world, to our own troubled American religious ecosystem, and also to Muslims in Morocco. Thank you. Our final panelist is Professor Terence Johnson, who's an Associate Professor of Religion and Government at Georgetown, where he has joint appointments in the Department of Theology and the Department of Government. He is an affiliate member of the Department of African American Studies as well. Professor Johnson is a faculty fellow at the Berkeley Center and serves on the executive committee of the Program for Jewish Civilization. His research interests include ethics, political theory, African-American religions, and religion and public life. He previously was an assistant professor of religion at Haverford College. He also worked at Harvard University as a proctor. Professor Johnson is the author of Tragic Soul Life, W.E.B. Dubois, and The Moral Crisis Facing American Democracy. His current book project addresses the impact of the American Jeremiah on U.S. political discourse. Professor Johnson holds a BA from Morehouse College and MDiv from Harvard Divinity School and a PhD from Brown University. 
So please welcome Professor Johnson. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to the organizers of this event for including me uh, as a sort of novice of Murray Scholarship, but I'm delighted to uh, join you, and especially uh, I want to thank my colleagues from Theology who are here, and also thank my former dean, Father Hare. We uh, loved you and, and, and were inspired by your leadership during our t my time as a student at Divinity School, so it's great to see you. Uh, nearly two decades, for nearly two decades, a handful of religious scholars began invoking uh, John Courtney Murray in public debates concerning the appropriate role of religion in the public square. For many, such as Leslie Griffin and Thomas O'Brien, Murray represented the best Catholic response to Richard Rorty's characterization of religion as a conversation stopper, claiming that Murray's account of religious liberty both echoed and endorsed the political sentiments of Rawlsian liberalism. I wonder, though, if it's now time to revisit those claims. One of the reasons scholars identified Murray as a distant cousin within the Rawlsian family had everything to do with Murray's understanding that one's philosophical, i.e. comprehensive beliefs, should not determine what the Constitution demands of us within the liberal democratic society. As John Hitchcock notes, quote, one is not obliged within Murray's theological anthropology to accept any particular philosophical assumptions but must merely agree to respect the Constitution for the sake of civil harmony, end quote. Indeed, Hitchcock goes on to demonstrate how Murray's theological commitment to affirming and abiding by constitutional principles reinforced religious liberty and promoted liberalism's desire to promote a free and open society. By embracing a thin version of political liberalism, Murray was then able to protect the, quote, truth and truthfulness of Catholicism without diminishing religion's important role within the liberal democratic state. Hitchcock's overall argument is rather compelling, and yet I wonder if Murray's view of history and commitment to the natural law undermine our efforts to locate Murray within the Rawlsian tradition. As many of you know, John Rawls's tradition of political liberalism has faced fierce criticism for its stance on religion. By distinguishing religion from politics, Rawlsian liberalism impedes religion and religious reasons from entering public debates as the primary reason or justification for one's political stance. In fact, while religious reasons can be used in our competing and overlapping political commitments, we should only do so when they align with and affirm our agreed upon notions of political justice. Citizens then, within Rawls' ideal society, are compelled, if not convicted, to retrieve political reasons to justify their conceptions of justice. This delineation of religion, political liberals often argue, protects religion from unusual abuses from the state and individual state actors. Critics of Rawlsian liberalism, like the noted legal scholar Stephen Carter, charge political liberals with treating religion, though, as a kind of hobby. How, then, do we understand Murray's role within a liberal society that claims to be committed to robust pluralism and individual liberty? I'm not sure political liberalism is the best model for thinking through Murray's work. While Murray retrieved a, quote, liberal vocabulary to define religious liberty in his public writings, his understanding of the tragic sense of history and humankind's dogged and sometimes reckless individualism underscore the limits of locating Murray within a political liberal project. Murray's thought seems to teeter between a comprehensive liberalism and a kind of thin traditionalism. That is, he recognizes the undeniable need to protect individual religious liberty, but fears liberalism's weak rejection of tradition and tradition's role in guiding individual political behavior. The tension here raises a compelling question left unanswered by Murray. To what extent does bad faith, or dare I say sin, make it impossible for liberalism to address the ways in which tragic history, as well as our moral beliefs, um, inform and sometimes contradict our religious commitments? While our religious doctrine may embrace the stranger, the refugee, the transgendered community, and the immigrant, 
our moral beliefs often motivate us to make political commitments that undermine the very religion and religious doctrines we claim to embrace. For this reason, Murray argues, quote, that the central problem of today is not faith and reason, but faith and history, end quote. In light of the bloodshed of the 20th century and our current crisis of terrorism, climate change, immigration, global, global white nationalism, and police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women, Murray leaves us with a staggering challenge. Are we willing to allow the spirit of Murray's writings to push us to imagine new political and religious possibilities? One way of doing so, I argue, is to define and delineate religious liberty within the context of the tragic history in and through which liberty and equality emerge in the modern West. This, I believe, will allow us to remain faithful to Murray's commitment to religious liberty and also to beckon his implicit warnings of humankind's inclination to cling to the familiar and to avoid the deep reflection and contemplation of the potential harms of our, val of our valued traditions and religious beliefs. Before diving into Murray's understanding of religious liberty, I want to sketch out uh, Rawls' ideal understanding of citizens and public reason, categories I believe are necessary for imagining the significance of Murray's contribution to political theory and political theology. According to Rawls, political actors, specifically citizens, embody at least two important components. First, in a democratic republic, citizens represent those persons who are considered to be free and rational subjects. Secondly, these citizens possess two basic moral principles, the capacity to conceptualize justice and the good, and the ability to reason. Characterizing citizens as primarily free and equal assumes two important points. First, citizens do not need to examine the limits and underlying assumptions concerning their political status. Second, citizens are not obliged to address in the ideal political realm the situated narratives in and through which they come to understand and subsequently justify their political commitments. Here's my concern with this ideal model of the citizen. Not all citizens are simply free and equal. Some are free, equal, black, and Muslim, free, equal, Latina, and lesbian, and free, equal, white, Jewish, male, and heterosexual. These social markers, religious associations, gender and sexual identities, which are bracketed in Rawls's procedural model, often overshadow and limit within a liberal society one's status as free and equal. For Rawls, public reason serves as the acceptable form of discourse that citizens may then employ within the political project. According to Rawls, quote, we may, we may over the course of life come freely to accept as the outcome of reflective thought and reasoned judgment the ideals, principles, and standards that specify our basic rights and liberties and effectively guide and moderate the political power to which we are subject. This is the outer limit of our freedom." End quote. Public reason then attempts to support the basic political structure of a liberal society. It also is not intended, uh, on the other hand, to adjudicate religious, philosophical, or moral debates that play a significant role in shaping non-political concerns. Instead, Public reason is designed to steer public deliberation. In the defense of liberal public reason, our slavery and abortion hard cases, Stephen Mikado argues that argues, excuse me, Stephen Mikado disagrees with Rawls' strict definition of public reason and suggests that public reason serves to facilitate deep controversies. Quote, the commitment to public reasonableness helps determine how some substantive political conflicts should be discussed and even settle. In addition, the centrality of public reasonableness of li for liberalism helps make it clear that liberalism has an important civic dimension. It proposes not simply a set of negative mechanisms for limiting and controlling political power, but also includes the positive means for fostering a politics worthy of esteem." End quote. Now, in many respects, Michito is really trying to argue for an extension of public reason as a way, uh, I think, to expand public reason 
to the extent that it can actually lead to some forms of uh, social transformation. Now, though Rawls, is, uh, strict rest though Rawls restricts public reason's reach to address some of his earlier critics, this restatement of public reason assumes one fundamental point, the ability of political actors and government officials to speak independently of the cultural narratives that shape their comprehensive commitments, what Rawls calls their background culture. Now, Rawls agrees that we need, quote, a full and open, end quote, um, notion of debates within the public culture uh, on a range of matters. But if those debates do not leave an imprint on public reason, and if they don't also lead to possibly reshaping and remodifying the range of public forms and the range of public reason, what is the point of said discussions? Public reason, I argue, fails to make good on the ends it wants to ensure. Without an ethical commitment to attend to cultural inheritance, public reason and its language of rights cannot allay the cultural conditions that too often lead to violence against subjugated groups. Rawlsian public reason forces us to deliberate in the dark, and by doing so, we develop notions of liberty, freedom, and agency that do not take into account the role of culture and moral beliefs in fostering anti-rights cult countercultures that assumes the following. If I can get away with it, I will do it. I stand in solidarity with Ram Coles, who argues in Beyond Gated Politics that public reason is designed to reinforce the scope and goals of political liberalism without offering the necessary resources to question and subsequently to expand the objectives of public reason. By limiting public um, reason's reach, Rawlsian liberalism is threatened by the very historical tragedies and comprehensive doctrines that Rawls wants to bracket. As Coles aptly asserts, political liberalism is, quote, both, ha both haunted by a ghost it conjures up and relieved by a ghost it conjures away, end quote. If public reason is intended to correspond to an idealized form of historic specific circumstances, it must then incorporate a vocabulary that takes into account the competing narratives political actors and citizens rely on to establish their political commitments and that inform their moral beliefs. Such a move will create the conditions to take seriously moral disagreement and begin the deliberative process of exploring in public spaces the veracity of our competing and overlapping moral beliefs. Philosopher Moody, Michelle Moody Adams reminds us in Fieldwork in Familiar Places that moral disagreements should not undermine our public culture. Instead, embracing moral disagreement would, quote, inevitably reorder the settled convictions that one brings to its contemplation. In doing so, it will effect at least some change in the structure and content of self-understandings, end quote. This goal can be achieved, I believe, by expanding the kinds of resources that are retrieved to define public, re public reason and to limit public deliberations. Only a view of public reason that foregrounds the conditions for self-reflection, suspension of judgment, and internal criticism can adequately benefit a world bemused by Rawlsian liberalism's focus on rights in isolation of comprehensive human flourishing. To be sure, Public reason ought to lead us beyond discussions of liberty and social cooperation to include conversations that tackle, for instance, the role of epistemic diversity and narrative in establishing democratic traditions and public cultures. Instead of limiting the terms of the debate, public reason ought to remind us and ought to expand and serve as a guiding discourse for imagining conceptual frameworks that might affirm what currently works in public debates, refute inadequate discourses, and political propositions and support the reordering of moral commitments when necessary. Now, though, more, though um, Murray would feel inclined to support the grand ideals of public reason, I wonder if Murray's account of religious liberty as a human right weakens the viability of public reason. And for that matter, I wonder if it subsequently rebukes liberalism's treatment of history and historical tragedies within its ideal understanding of how we ought to build a just society. Despite what Thomas O'Brien calls Murray's, quote, Americanist political bias, 
I can't help but wonder if Murray's criticisms of Vietnam pacifists for relying on, quote, abstract ethics to condemn all warfare is not a subtle reflection of his wide understanding of history, even when he fails to address specific historical accounts in his writings. Now, Murray's, Murray's position on theology and politics seems to be both strategic and loosely prophetic. This is evident in his uncanny ability to remain firmly rooted in Catholicism while also promoting religious liberty um, on liberal terms. According to law professor Leslie Griffin, Murray in the early 1940s wrestled with the tension between doctrinal claims of Catholicism as the one true religion and the growing need for Catholics to cooperate with other Christians. As Murray describes it, quote, can we in complete loyalty to the truth and in perfect integrity of conscience come together in a unity of cooperative action for the solution of our common temporal problems, end quote. Inter interestingly enough, Murray promoted a form of Catholicism that maintained its deep theological commitment even as he developed a theological rationale for interreligious dialogue, or what he specifically called interconfessional uh, agreement. Nearly two decades later, in 1965, Murray deepened his call for widespread religious cooperation to proclaim that religious freedom was a human right. Quote, religious freedom, right, is at the very core um, a human right, and it requires sanction as a civil right guaranteed by human law, end quote. Now, the shift to human rights is a critical move. Indeed, it acknowledges in part that appeals to humankind's conscious and ethical demands for justice are insufficient. Murray says as much when he raised the following question in his essay, Religious Freedom. Quote, does religious freedom in this sense allow for the freedom of conscience or even from man's duty to follow conscience? End quote. Interestingly, assuming my reading is correct, freedom of conscience is far too abstract of an ideal for Murray. Moving from conscious and moral consciousness to human rights implicitly situates appeals to ethics and moral duty within a historical consciousness, what he called, quote, an awareness that demands attention to the inherent dignity of man as emerging in history under the impact of developing human, human experience, end quote. In other words, ethics and conscience must be realized in the flesh as embodied actions in society. Murray's shift from religious cooperation to religious liberty as a human right also reflects his anticipation of increasing resistance within the public sphere to thick religions, religion and religious expressions in the public sphere. Implicit within Murray's argument is a clear understanding of two fundamental principles. First, the need within liberal nation states to create deliberative spaces in which political actors can invoke more reasons to justify their support for liberal positions. Second, Murray tips his hat in support of protecting religious pluralism. Quote, whether we like it or not, Murray asserted in the 1940s, we are living in a religiously pluralist society at a time of spiritual crisis. And the alternatives are the discovery of social unity or destruct destruction. To this end, Murray writes in the problem of the religion of the state um, that the theological task of the moment is not simply to carry on the polemic, quote, against continental liberalism. It is also to explore, under the guidance of the church, the possibilities of a vital adapt adaptation of church-state doctrine to the constitutional structure, the political institutions, and the ethos of freedom characteristic of the democratic state, end quote. Catholicism, then, then ought to remain active especially in the U.S. context and abroad, in politics and philosophical discussions on democracy and democratic theory. Now, our friend and colleague, Leon Hooper, questions if Murray's liberal language actually impeded our efforts to overcome the individualism, right, and the, and the indifference to re religious diversity in his writings. In my limited reading uh, of Murray, I think not, in part because Murray gives us strategically or not, the liberal language, right, to invoke um, a kind of social vision that aligns with the dominant liberal discourse. And in many respects, I wonder if, like Queen Esther, does Murray challenge us, right, to go to the king 
and if one perish, one perishes. But the goal within Murray is to stand and to stand and be heard. So in the conclusion then, you know, I think Murray leaves us with the challenge. And part of the challenge is how do we not simply lock him into a historical moment? But is it possible then to read his work and read within it this, a, a certain spirit that allows us not simply to invoke sort of every kind of principle and, and unlock it to his way of thinking, but is it possible then to invoke sort of the spirit of his gesture for a certain kind of, of, of deep religious liberty in a way then that may actually push beyond what he actually imagined? So thank you for listening to my, uh, my thoughts. Thank you. So thank you to our panelists for many ideas, both inspiring and challenging. So questions that you have. And questions of one another, right? Well, let me uh, just raise one issue with Paul. I thought your, your uh, example from uh, the Islamic community in Morocco was a very stimulating and, and uh, interesting one. And, uh, it points to the question of, and it, it relates a bit to what Terence was saying about sort of this liberalism model that you find in Rawls. Um, you're suggesting that there's something in Mary and in the Second Vatican Council, I take it, that, that enabled Muslims in Morocco to say yes, to say that this is, and I take it, that was that it was not a kind of vision of religious freedom that basically privatized religion and removed it from its larger social influence. And that would lead to Muslims being able to say that's a way we can keep our, our religious vision of our social life together. And, but still, a, and am I correct in understanding what you're, what you're saying there? I mean, that's a way in which we could see Murray wanting to argue that religious freedom does not mean privatization of religion. It means religion should be able to have an influence on shaping civil society and uh, culture and so forth, but it still has to prevent us from moving toward uh, religion taking over the state. Uh, is, that, is that correct? And if it is, yeah. would that mean that, that these Muslims that you were talking about would be ready to endorse the kind of vision that somebody like Abdullahi an naim in his book on Islam and the secular state, in which he wants to be a firm Muslim, but is saying Islam can play an important social role, it's just that it shouldn't take over control of the state. Would that be the direction in which you're, 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 you're suggesting we should be moving? Hmm. So maybe I can say two or three or maybe even four things in okay, response great. to that. Uh, <laughs> so much uh, to be explored, but just very quickly. So yes, on one level, uh, this idea of freedom as a freedom for rather than a freedom from, I mean, this is an old idea, but uh, I think that's at play in what we're talking about, um, uh, especially the idea of freedom for a moral, a moral purpose and a commitment to others, whatever that might mean. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the idea that uh, freedom is still bound by truth rather than truth, uh, rather than freedom being truth, um, which is, I think, very prominent in this culture, that that's the end and purpose of life is freedom. And for them, uh, you, it has to be oriented and uh, in service of the truth. Uh, but you know, then we explored that idea that, well, you know, even those who err um, in their conscience um, still have a place. They can't be denied. But the point is that the paradigm is truth um, and freedom at play in that, even when people go wrong with it, rather than people determining what truth is individually in a private sense. So I would just add that in addition to the moral purposefulness, the idea that the truth is not out the window anymore, uh, that that can be discussed, uh, whether in a classroom or in other communities. Um, 
you know, with Abdullahi and Naeem, um, you know, uh, well, first of all, I should say that, that, you know, you have plenty of Muslims who are on board with very neoliberal ideas of freedom, just as there are all sorts of Christians on board with that. And so there's just an incredible diversity within Muslim communities as within other communities. So you'll find, uh, now, I think some people might feel that um, his thinking goes a little bit too neoliberal, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's not welcome in his own country. Right. Uh, right. But there again, I mean, I would suggest that is because he's a threat to the state more than he's a threat to the, to the, to the religious Islamics. community. Yeah. You know, but we confuse those things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, what, 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 I, what I would say is, is that for, for, for Muslims of a kind of a traditional pious bent, they, they would be willing to look at this question not in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Sharia categories that might seem antiquarian today, and that's what Naeem is trying to do. Is, we, is that really what the message from God was all about? Some of these categories that puts men above women and free above slave and all that stuff and Muslim above non-Muslim, is that really the message? And, so I think a lot of Muslims today, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, when I first uh, got involved in this in the 90s, I would have to pull teeth to get Muslims involved in Christian Muslim co-reflection. And then 9-11 happened and they were keen on it because they felt the image of Islam on the global stage was distorted. And then when ISIS went into Mosul, they were like, where are we? We gotta do this, we gotta have this. Um, and so I think one, one way that they're willing to think about this, um, again, I'm speaking mainly about pious traditional Muslims, is what is it that benefits and what is it that harms? Just that simple equation. That's at the heart of Sharia, they would say. And so they might be willing to walk with people like Abdul Na Lahi Naim in certain ways. They might disagree with them on what's beneficial and what's not. Um, but you know, uh, this is, I think, a question on the table is, what I would refer to as a Muslim open society, and I've, I've talked on this in, in, in Morocco and other places, so an open society that has the, the, the idea of a free exchange of ideas and, 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 um, and the right to dissent. Um, you know, and I'm not necessarily speaking about an open society in the way that George Soros advances it, but, but nevertheless, a Muslim open society would be that, where you can dissent um, if it isn't harming, you know, uh, and Islam might still be patronized and affirmed, but people could dissent from it. And so I think there's a lot that's moving in that direction. And so we need to think about what benefits and what harms us, um, uh, you know, this flourishing in a moral sense, uh, but, but the possibility that, that, um, that, that we need an, a, an exit from this situation in, the Muslim world between the authoritarian state and the jihadist terrorists. You know, one rears his head and the other rears his head or whatever, you know, and, and, and this idea of John Courtney Murray might be a way to move beyond that thing, that, that, that cycle, that vicious cycle of uh, dictator and terrorists that, that, that a lot of Muslim societies are caught up in that and they exploit one another and they use one another. And, and so, uh, you know, there's incredible readiness uh, because of these awful situations. Um, and, you know, yet it can't be at the expense of people's convictions, but I think this view of John Courtney Murray is a way for Muslims to have their cake and eat it too, to see that we gotta get out of this, and yet, and, yet, and yet we still want to, you know, advocate for a moral, moral public reasoning in some of the ways that Terrence was, yeah, so all sorts of things going on there. Very encouraging. You know. Yeah, yeah hopeful, hopeful, yeah. Big, big obstacles though, big obstacles, yeah. 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 I have a question for Professor Johnson. I was very intrigued by uh, your cl concluding remarks about uh, how do we not lock John Courtney Murray into a historical moment? Can we read his work uh, for a deeper religious liberty that may push beyond what he actually imagined? And you had said a little bit earlier that the potential for what are the contributions of a thick religion in the public sphere. I wonder if you might uh, trace out some of how you think we can 
push him beyond what he imagined because I, I think you're, you're right and one of the contributions is his giving us uh, permission for change and, and a methodology for change. But I was wondering what your imaginings were on this topic. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. That's a uh, really good question. And I think I'll answer in terms of so how I sort of tr try to imagine Murray. And part of it, I, I wanted to figure out, well, what is he actually saying, for example, about civil rights or about what's happening in the U.S. context in particular to, to see if that's actually shaping his global response. And um, I called our great scholar, uh, Leon, for some assistance. And, um, and what I realized is that maybe I'm asking the wrong question. And I thought, well, maybe if I look at what he's actually addressing and what he's hinting at, that might give me um, sort of permission to see how Murray's very helpful in some of the debates that I'm, I'm, I'm deeply interested in. So I think, so part of what I guess my fear is with Murray, as, as is my fear with Rawls, is that we read, we read them as if they're scripture, that they write something that's scriptural and that's doctrinal in a very thick sense. And um, I think when you look at Murray's sort of strategy in terms of how he's sort of appropriating sort of liberal language, um, and at the same time, there's a recognition of what's uh, of acknowledging sort of the, the anxiety among Americans about the Vietnam War and about McCarthyism, that even when he's not specifically addressing these issues, they're clearly right floating in his orbit. And so I'm wondering if that's the case, then how then can we potentially extend? And so I, I, I think the human rights piece is really interesting because that forces, I think, Christians and Catholics and, and, and religions, religionists in general to imagine how they understand what it means to be human, not simply based upon their own tradition and based upon the terms that they find very familiar and very comfortable, but also based upon the sort of broader category that is slightly intimidating, as, and as Paul said, potentially may invoke a kind of disgust. Mm -hmm. So I think before, I say, so I think sort of the road toward imagining beyond sort of the sort of strict interpretation of Murray is then to be, I think, one to be very generous in terms of how one is interpreting. Uh, Murray, but then also to look at what, you know, Spivak and others say, what, what isn't said in the text. And by looking at what isn't said, I think there's sort of, there's great promise. Could I ask? Oh. Um, I was thinking this morning we heard um, about uh, the, the climate of Murray's work as um, cool and dry, and uh, the work of kind of men locked together in argument. And I think what you have each invoked in some way invites a kind of um, messiness in terms of a space for acknowledging um, narratives and the thickness of identity and uh, the emotional life and especially this dimension of, um, of disgust. And, and so thinking also that we're navigating a world um, where we don't have the, the gatekeepers in terms of what's getting communicated and, and uh, social media and the like. Um, how, do you, how do you see this conversation um, going ahead, thinking of also the way that it's invoking a kind of unboundedness and it's not falling into neat, rational categories? And what do we do with the mess that this invokes today? No, I mean, I think this is sort of the great challenge, and as part of it is an extension of the question that was raised before, I'm wondering if, on one level, does it force us to see what, hap what, that, see what happens when religion is invoked in public spaces? Can we then assume that religion remains static and that re religion is sort of untouched by the deep debates in the public sphere? And so I think there is a fear among those of us who are deeply committed to our traditions to want to hold on to a certain version of the tradition and, but yet want the right and privilege to exercise our religious reasons in, public, in the public sphere, but then we can't assume then that when we go back to the quote unquote, our church or the synagogue or wherever, that then we're gonna read the text in the same way, that as we get muddied and we wrestle in the public sphere, I think we have to recognize that our sort of hermeneutical approach to scripture and to tradition will become muddied. And I think the challenge for the church, for all religions, is to figure out, well, how then do we sort of hold on to our tradition, recognizing that in 100 years, we might, we might be proven wrong. And to me, that's potentially sort of the great promise of what reason brings to, to, to life, what reason brings to the public sphere, this ability to change and to modify uh, and to make room for new possibilities. I'd just Paul? add, if I could, I mean, <coughs> the slogan I'd like to see get out there is no freedom without friendship. No freedom without friendship. So 
that doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, the laws should be on the book and the, you know, but all this messiness that you're talking about needs friendship. You know, you, 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 you can disagree radically with people. That's where we're at, where we're seeing our existences canceling out one another. Mm -hmm. but, but so we need to add this to the, to the Murray vision or draw it out if it's already there, that that has to be there and that should be in the way uh, that we teach in our universities, in our high schools, no freedom without friendship. Again, that's not the role of the state. Um, the role of the state is to you know, have that law there uh, but in the societal level where the messiness is, we need to bring that slogan out there into our, into our way of educating and engaging. No freedom, no, no, no freedom without friendship. But I, in this respect, I just want to kind of bounce this question to, over to David, and maybe he already had some things to say. Because one of my questions and concerns is that um, it's often governmental agencies, including our own State Department, that are kind of tasked with dealing with religious freedom, uh, both to monitor it, but then to uh, promote it. And um, they're doing great things, and this is not a critique, and I think they're also befuddled by some of this messiness. But, you know, and I, and I see in other societies, often it's, it's a human rights, it's a, it's a government NGO, often with the term human rights, that is tasked with dealing with, 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 with religious liberty or religious freedom, but it's a, it's a state-sponsored, um, and I see that more and more, not to say that it's not going on elsewhere, but I guess, I guess I'd guess i be curious to know from you, David, in light of what you said, and also how, how would John Courtney Murray's vision um, look at that reality? It's not the only reality today, but it's a prominent reality that it's, it's actually states that are kind of doing that work, if that makes sense. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question, but one thing, let me say just say this, that um, dealing with the realities of the role of religion in, in public life, um, it seems to me, calls on us to think both about what we mean by shared, locked together in argument uh, regarding what the law should be, for example, but also, I, I, I think, and that's where you get into issues like public reason. Uh, but I'm also interested in the question of public imagination, which may have something to do with an overlap with what you're implying by friendship there. Mm -hmm. That Take Martin Luther King. Um, King's approach to advancing the civil rights of black people in the United States was to appeal both to the norms of the US Constitution from a point of view of a certain kind of reasoned argument about what rights people ought to have from a legal point of view, but he also appealed to the Bible in a very powerful way. He could get up and give this I have a dream speech and he, he's invoking a whole imaginative world of what it's like to move into the promised land from being in Egypt and all of this sort of thing. And, but he did it in a way that was respectful of those who were different from him. He wasn't trying to say, you have to buy the book of Exodus as your own belief system. Mm -hmm. But he appealed to a certain kind of imaginative vision of what human life could be like if it was lived in freedom uh, as shaped by a biblical vision. Um, now, how you put together these imaginative dimensions together with the more rational argument dimensions that um, you were referring to a few minutes ago, uh, this, is, this is a complicated task. And, one of my convictions is that these two realities influence each other. That, that King's imaginative vis biblical vision influenced the way he read the Constitution. But the way he read the Constitution influenced the way he read the Bible. Uh, there was a kind of back and forth movement. Now, what that su su suggests for me is that as we move forward, the kind of solidarity or friendship uh, that comes out of a deeper religious conviction and about love for one's neighbor, not just 
sort of some sort of distant respect for ones. Those kinds of things become important to shaping the framework. Within, and part of it happens in civil society and part of it happens in the formation of law. And the interaction between law and civil society is a complicated one. It doesn't, and, and I think both Rawls and Murray think they're more radically separate from each other than they actually are. Now the danger of collapsing them into each other is that it can become coercive uh, in the name of religion or in the name of an imagine. But so you want to avoid that and I'm not trying, but how to put them together is a little bit more, maybe that's the messiness that yeah. you're talking about uh, or the, the issue about how public reason really works mm. is a little more complicated yeah. than either Rawls right. or Murray talks about argument working. I think, yes. I don't know, that's. Um. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul, I was really uh, moved by your discussion of disgust uh, as, as, <laughs> as a, a, a variable here. Um, I, I guess uh, that gets me to the point that uh, this is this is not something that's going to be resolved intellectually, huh. I guess. Is, is and I, I think it gets to what uh, Drew, uh, what uh, David was just saying about imagination. Um, <coughs> uh, Murray, I guess, was in conversation with what were considered the white male intellectuals of his time, and and we've lost the ball. Uh, that's not where the game's played anymore. It's played in social media. It's played out in the streets. Um, so I guess I have two questions. Why is it that, ideolo that, that these divisive ideolo ideologies, both the nativists, the jihadists, the, uh, et cetera, are finding such fruit fruitful or fertile ground uh, today uh, around the world, in the United States and elsewhere, Europe, Middle East, and what can be done in response uh, to, uh, uh, to that? Uh, I, just, I just don't think it's gonna be resolved by deciding whether Rawls or Niebuhr or Murray were, were correct. I, you know, it's going to be resolved somewhere else, and I, I'm not sure we're thinking about that yet, I, except where David was talking about imagination. Um, anyway, I, I, I don't know if, if you ha can add something to what you were saying. Um, just a couple thoughts. Um, I, not exactly sure why you know things are going in this way of uh, nativism and, and jihadism and supremacism in general. Uh, you know, it's this odd post Cold War moment where everything uh, you know seems confused. Uh, it's a lengthy discussion that we could have. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, but I guess in terms of what can be done, uh, we have to think in terms of small steps. And so. Um, just one thing is uh, the training of our police forces to get over their disgust that are coming from the communities they belong to. You know, you have cases of, of, of uh, Sunni vigilante s uh, squads uh, killing Shia and the police just standing aside or, you know, vice versa. Any, you know, the police, they're, they're the communities that they're in, um, and how that uh, you know keeps them from protecting people's liberties, and so you know, and I know that's a case in our own uh, society where we need to. So that that might be one small step, but I think very significant is that if police forces around the world were were trained, if their training included the emotional, because they've got such baggage. I mean, there's so many cases of of police standing aside. Now, I mean, you could speculate why that is. Maybe they don't want to get killed, or you know, maybe they feel it's just better to stand aside. But I, I think a lot of it uh, is, is, is along these lines of communal disgust that they, too, are, are, are impacted by you know, our, our own racial profiling in this country and things like that. So that might be one small but significant place to start, is helping 
our law enforcement people to think about being part of this beloved community and not being dictated to by the emotional attitudes they've been raised by. So that's one thing. I'm sure there's all sorts of other techniques, but I don't think there's going to be a grand, you know, fanfare event. Uh, it's, it's going to be small little steps. Um, I mean, it happened in Europe. I mean, Europeans were tribal peoples uh, just bashing each other until the 20th century, right? I mean, it was tribal mentalities, German and French, and they looked at each other in disgust, and, and yet somehow that's been reimagined. So it can be done. But my guess is it just has to take these small, smaller, but, but strategic steps. I, I don't know if that's a answering your question, uh, but maybe some others. Are there comments on that? Oh. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Professor Hack. Um, I was hit by your uh, quote of the Moroccan person um, about religious liberty and well, we, we all know that proposing or even exporting religious liberty uh, could be seen as a colonialist way of approaching the topic especially in countries where religion and political spheres are not structured as they are in, in the so-called Western Christianity and so like looking Looking at it from the perspective of Murray, I would say, yeah, argument is okay. I mean, could be adapted in a way. But, and religious freedom could be adapted if we look at it as human dignity, like the, the, uh, expression, the, the recognition of human dignity. But uh, I think we should be careful because Murray was very much historical. His ideas was, were very much based into the historical experience of the church in the United States. So it was very, very much contextualized. And so that's the reason why Dignitatis Humanae might work because it's more doctrinal and could be much more easily extended to other situations. But what I meant, what I meant to ask you is that now we have new, new approaches to secularization. We know Jose Casanova or Bargava are Describing, yeah, he's here. <laughs> They're trying to read uh, the the distribution of the space between like religious sphere and political sphere in a different way, which could include non-Western Christianity. So, how how what can you say about Islamic countries towards like how what do you what can you say about the 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 uh, self understanding of religion and politics in the Islamic countries and how this could bring to the uh, recognition of religious freedom. I mean, it's, so how would you contextualize religious freedom in Islamic countries? Uh, well, that's a huge question. Uh, yeah, I know, but... Um, <laughs> but, you know, your point about uh, <coughs> states sometimes being the promoters of religious liberty, I guess this was partly the question I was raising before. Uh, it has a kind of neo-colonial aspect. It can be perceived that way if it's not always intended that way. And even um, authoritarian states colonizing their own people, it's not just the old Western empires, you know, it's, it's within, state, within nation states, it's their own governments colonizing them and um, telling them what they should think and how they should behave in all of these, 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 these areas of governmentality. Um, but, I mean, again, Muslims run the gamut, you know, um, as Christians, as Jews do, of their understandings and their self-understandings. Um, but I guess what I would say is that, and, and this ties in perhaps to what Terence was, was mentioning, is that uh, at times if you read uh, people like Murray and others who are, you, you almost think religion is, is a set of beliefs. Um, you have your beliefs and I have my beliefs and you know, we'll just live together. Maybe this is the Rawlsian overlapping consensus that doesn't get to the fact that we're also wanting to message our values into the public sphere and we're not just gonna privatize that. So for them, religion is, is, is a moral system. Religion is a moral system, a public moral system. Now we can talk about what that means. 
um, and the possibility that it could move and shift. I mean, you know, within the Sharia tradition, there's all sorts of things that we would call principles, and they have their precedence, but, you know, the precedents may no longer be valid, and they're willing to update those if the principles demand it, uh, the intentions of the Sharia. They've got all sorts of jurisprudential tools uh, to, to rethink Sharia traditions. Um, and now that's controversial for some people. Uh, um, you know, so there's that idea of religion as, as a moral system. Uh, but, you know, there, there is this added question, well, I mean, couldn't Judaism and Christianity be part of that moral system, or does it have to be Islam, you know, that is that public moral system? Um, uh, you know, uh, there's sometimes this fear, these other messy issues. Uh, sometimes I get a sense that their concern is, 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 is about the moral, but then the other, the other concern is, is um, yeah, I mean, if, if you open the door to uh, freedom, um, uh, suddenly people are going to leave Islam, right? And, you know, again, they're thinking about that in uh, moral categories, but there's that fear there, too. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, we can talk about it more. But I, I would say we have this, and I see it among my students here, this idea that religion is, is like your beliefs and my beliefs, and, and, and I don't think that's what Murray was talking about, but he... As Terence was suggesting, it could have moved in that direction. And, and so it's a, it's a great, we're, we're on the cusp of an extraordinary moment. I mean, you know, uh, Islam is the big elephant in the global room, and, but uh, we, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary opportunity for us to rethink even the very, our very categories of religion, yeah. Just one, could one yeah. make one comment on that? I mean, one of the things that's really interesting that I've seen in several other contexts is that, I mean, Catholicism was a very big elephant in the room before the Second Vatican Council, and mm -hmm. something very significant happened. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just John Courtney Murray that brought it about. There was a whole set of things going on around, I mean, Murray played a key role, but there were all sorts of things going on in Roman Catholicism that led to what happened at the Second Vatican Council. And you could say, well, there's an argument, I mean, this is several people have made this claim, that there's an argument going on internal to Islam about where to go in the future. And um, there may be some ways that what Catholicism has been through might be suggesting some hints. It's not going to tell Islam what to do, but it gives some hints about ways that that sort of development might happen internal to Islam. And I take it that's part of what you're sort of pointing toward and how some people maybe in your experience learned a little bit from reading Murray that maybe that they said, yeah, we could do, we could move this yeah. way and it wouldn't yeah. be a betrayal of our tradition. Yeah. Uh, I don't and know. It would be good for Islam. I mean, I yeah. think that's how we yeah. have to think about these things. Yeah. This is a win-win for everyone yeah. because the way it's often presented is that, well, you have to give up all of your Islam. You, you have to give up Islam to be part. But, but aren't Catholics saying the very same thing as the church seems to move closer in line, alignment with the state? Isn't that the big issue in terms of abortion, reproductive rights, that people are concerned that it's the very same fears that Muslims have, Catholics have as well? Well, all people, I would say all peoples want their values to be publicly established in yeah. some sense. All peoples from the, we all want that. We all want our, we, we, we don't want our beliefs just to be ideas in our heads. We, we want them to have some public relevancy. I'd say we're all... But there are right. many different publics. And it doesn't have to be affirmed by sort of the state public or the bourgeois public. It can be affirmed mm -hmm. by your internal community within, locked within a veil. You don't mm -hmm. have to have this other kind of affirmation. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what some of your students, were, I think, were yeah. pushing back at. Yeah. That we have our own sense of religious liberty, but it just doesn't align with... Yeah. Sort of yeah, but well, okay, maybe what you're saying is, is echoing David that maybe in that moment there were still a lot of Catholics who assumed that for there to be public morality, Catholicism had to be established, and right. now that's all over. I mean, that's that's what Fenton and Cannell at Catholic University believed when they went after Mary, mm -hmm. that it had to be the established religion. And anyway, that, and this this is the question I think for our Muslim brothers and sisters who are ready for this and eager for this to be part of the global conversation rather than to be suspect members of the globe, is, is, is um, how to find a way to have a vigorous moral life uh, 
uh, including, uh, how did you call it, this uh, um, more, the, uh, freedom that also generates moral controversy, not necessarily fixed ideas, but how to have a vigorous public life apart from needing a state to back it. You know, I think that's where... Part of it also, it seems to me, is do you think that your tradition can actually develop? Or is it frozen? And, um, I mean, another issue that Murray raised, of course, was he said the, the issue at the debate at Second Vatican Council about religious freedom was really the debate about development of doctrine, whether change could be legitimate or not. Hmm. And that's still an ongoing argument, it seems to me, about, and it's an argument perhaps in Islam, and I suspect it's an argument within any number of religious traditions, maybe not even religious traditions, any tradition, yeah. whether it can change or grow, or is it, is it frozen, or how dynamic can it be before it becomes dissolved? Uh, mm -hmm. There's a diff difference between dynamism and dissolution, yeah. and finding how to, det I mean, this is what, uh, uh, was it Congar, uh, Chenu wrote the book, Vrai et Fausse Reform in the, dans l'Eglise, True and False Reform in the Church. Yeah. What's true reform? And what's a betrayal? And knowing that difference is a, yeah. is a, is a very uh, big question. Yeah, and I think that hits the nail on the head in a lot of the things going on in the Muslim community. It might not have the hierarchical institution centralization of the right. church, but how dynamic can the religious discourse be until it's dissolved, the way yeah. you put it? Yeah. And this religious liberty <laughs> issue, you know, when I talk with them, I like this is what's going to make it dynamic and not dissolve it. But that right. fear that it will be so dynamic that it gets dissolved, right, right, uh, without a papal figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that that concludes <laughs> our panel. Please join me in, in thanking our presenters. Thanks a lot. Good job. Thank you.